Hey guys, I'm Patrick. You're watching Adventure Moto Southwest, and today we're gonna check out one of the coolest spots in New Mexico, Cabazon Peak. What's going on everybody? Welcome to the channel. Today we're heading out to Cabazon Peak. It's a pretty cool landmark to check out. The nice thing about it is it's only an hour or two away from Albuquerque, uh, headed on Highway 550. So I guess it's actually called a volcanic plug. The cool thing is a lot of people climb it. I will not be doing that today because I have seen some of those videos of people climbing it. The last stretch is pretty intense, pretty steep. You're definitely scrambling. Um, so that's not what I will be doing, especially in my motorcycle gear and boots and whatnot. So actually, I'm going to be taking the back road to get there today, which should be fun. Once I get onto the, um, the BLM land up here, it will be completely dirt the whole way. I've never done it before, so we'll see how the path is. Um, I'm going to be using the OnX off-road app today. I pre checked the route there is supposedly a route that goes through and we will check in with you guys as we get a little bit closer to the blm land and capazone peak stay tuned and by the way i'm taking the yamaha xt on this adventure today um, i think this is going to be the best choice um, i've ridden part of this road on my africa twin before and it does fine but the thing with high desert terrain like where i live here in new mexico is there is a lot of deep sand and sometimes that sand is surprise deep sand. You can't always tell. So lighter is better, at least in my mind. And um, this bike also has the fuel range for it. So not that the Africa Twin doesn't. Uh, it certainly can go a good stretch over 200 miles for sure. But this bike, I have put a Rotopax one gallon fuel tank on the back. So I have no issues with its fuel range. By the way, if you're new here, welcome. My name's Patrick. I make moto vlogs and moto video content and reviews. One of my goals with the channel is to highlight amazing rides that are somewhat undiscovered in New Mexico. A lot of people, when they travel through this area of the United States, um, they tend to overlook New Mexico. And I get it. When you're on the interstate going through New Mexico, the view is pretty bleak. There's not much going on, pretty flat for the most part. Um, and so from the highway, it definitely can look pretty uninteresting. But one of the things I wanted to do with this channel is showcase that there is a lot of amazing places here. In fact, it's kind of a undiscovered, a hidden gem, I would say. So hopefully we can bring some of that to light. But also I do ride a variety of uh, motorcycles and uh, in a variety of styles too. I just love anything two wheels. So today, like I said, I'm on the XT250 Yamaha Dual Sport. Um, probably if I had to keep only one bike, it would be this one. But I also have a Africa Twin as well, the base model. And that bike is fantastic for different reasons. Uh, it's almost the one bike to rule them all. I'm gonna probably do a video about that one pretty soon here about why I love it so much, but it's one or two, in my mind, fatal flaws that keep me from making it the, the top spot bike. But I also have a Harley Sportster, uh, 2015 Sportster 48. That's the one with the small tank. And I just got that one this year. So my first Harley, really enjoying it. Um, I was surprised at how much I liked that thing, actually. So. Um, so right now that is the lineup, that's the stable, and I will take you guys on various rides on those different bikes. So I would appreciate a subscribe, and don't forget to hit that bell icon for more, because we have a lot of great moto adventures and gear review coming up. Oh, the joys of a tiny bike on the highway. So this particular stretch of Highway 550 between Albuquerque and San Ysidro is at least in my experience, notoriously windy. And that is a lot of fun, to say the least, on a small dual sport such as the X-T250. But 
over the years, I've just gotten used to that. Um, I really like small bikes. For me, the fun factor of a small bike is just worth it always having one in the garage. So if you can tolerate being blown side to side on the freeway or on the highway, and of course being blown around as large semi trucks pass you, then this is the bike for you. And I know I'm not speaking too highly of this bike right now. You gotta just trust me that it really is my favorite bike currently that I own, maybe of all time, is of course its biggest and really only downside in my mind, minus being small, which I can't fault it for because a lot of bikes are small, but with this bike, it's the top speed. So right now, pinned on reasonably level highway, I can achieve 70 miles an hour, and that is what the speedometer says. Um, now this speedometer, like a lot of budget-friendly bikes, is not super accurate. It tends to read about three to four miles an hour faster than what I'm actually traveling at. So just keep that in mind. Um, and if I'm going uphill, I'll be lucky to get 65 or even sometimes 60 miles an hour uh, but the fuel economy is great, and I, I can't complain about that. And of course, it is super light. So for the majority of my riding, uh, at least when I'm doing off-road stuff, it suits me quite well because my goal is to not be on the highway. I guess one of the good things, though, is that you'll probably never get a speeding ticket on this bike. It's near impossible. Um, you'd have to try hard. And I, when I say that, you're going to be really wringing out the XT's neck. The thing about this bike is it has such capability and then because of its size, it's just one of those bikes that you just want to get on and ride because it's so easy to get going on it. It's not big, um, it's easy to throw a leg over, the seat height's super reasonable, it can accommodate a lot of riders. It's actually turned into the bike that I've ridden the furthest out of all my bikes. And I've owned a good amount of bikes over the years, but. Originally, the reason I bought the Africa Twin was actually to do the backcountry discovery route, the BDR, here in New Mexico. And so I bought that, got it all prepped, and uh, with bags and engine protection and all that stuff. And then I saw this bike on Craigslist posted, but it was in Ray, Colorado. Sorry, if you're from that town, I'm probably mispronouncing it. I always get it wrong. Ure, 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 I don't know. But it was posted there and I was like, man, this bike is probably a better bet for that. And a lot of it was already set up for me. It already had bags and whatnot. So, so I made the decision to drive to Colorado with my wife and pick up this bike and drive it back. And I ended up taking it all the way from Colorado up in the mountains straight down to Albuquerque, spent a couple days here, and got it prepped, and then drove it all the way down to Dell City, Texas, um, and did the southern half of the BDR. So this bike, within that span of time, within that week, uh, went from Colorado straight down New Mexico to Texas, and it was fantastic. Um, despite being super frigid in Colorado up in the mountain passes in the middle of the summer, still freezing cold, um, it was great and it did so well. And like I said, I have that Rotopax on it, so I've calculated it out and I'm getting about 250 miles of range on this thing. So that is pretty much unbeatable for a bike this size. And the thing that's crazy is I don't even really notice a dip in performance when I'm have the Rotopax on the back fully loaded with fuel versus when I don't, or when it's fully packed in with gear, I don't really notice much difference because there's no performance on this bike. That's the thing. <laughs> I never had any to start with, so you don't really notice much difference. Well, that was cold. Uh, it's January, by the way, and it was in the high teens last night, but it's the highway. It's what you gotta do to get to the good spots usually. So if you do come here, you turn on Cabazon Road off 550 and stay to the left, like it says. Um, to the right here is a, um, a mine where they mine some gypsum, I believe. I, I'm not 100% sure on that, but the, it's interesting because the whole top of that hill up there where the mine is, it is totally white. And when it's windy out here, there's a bunch of white clouds, like white dust blowing off of it. 
up here there's also a network of bike trails, uh, bicycle trails, and very popular with the mountain bikers and the fat tire bike crowd as well. But look at the scenery. I mean, come on. Are you kidding me? That's the great thing about this area is you get the high desert, but you also get mountains and hills like this too. Um, I don't know if I could ever live somewhere totally flat. Um, kudos to you guys who do it. Uh, and there's some great places that are truly beautiful that don't have the same topography as we do, but I just don't know if I could do it. Um, I like to explore these types of things and be surrounded by this beauty out here. So this road is super hard packed dirt. It's at least for the first stretch. Um, so it's not a problem at all on your motorcycle for really any bike, but up ahead here, we're going to hit some gravel and it depends on the time of year. Sometimes they put new gravel down and it's really deep and it can get a little tricky. I used to have a KLR and that bike was heavy and that was not fun on this gravel, nor has it been fun on the Africa Twin on this gravel. Um, on this dual sport though, it's totally fine, just go slow. But out past that, at least as far as I've been before, it does get pretty deep sand. And so that is something you have to think about for this route if you're gonna do it, um, is the deep sand factor and decide if that's something you're okay with. Um, the stretch of it's not super long because then it becomes packed again um, near Cabazon Peak. And I've been to Cabazon Peak a few times, but I've never taken this back road. So I know what the roads are near Cabazon, but I don't necessarily know what to expect in this stretch out here. Okay, so here is one of the downsides of this place. It is BLM land. So with that comes people shooting, of course. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not trying to judge, but of course that means we get a lot of shell things or bullet things. So unfortunately it comes with the area. And by the way, when you come to this place, the pretty early on, you're gonna come across this parking lot. There's some good trails in this area. But what I'll do up here is I'll show you guys a nice camping spot. A friend of mine and I have moto camped up here before and it is gorgeous. BLM land, so free. It's just up here on the right, past that first parking lot. And it's fairly secluded too. That's one of the best parts about it. Look at this landscape. Who says there's no color in the desert? This place has every color imaginable. Beautiful pastels, amazing rock formations, really cool stuff. So this spot's pretty great. Like I said, it's just about 20 feet past that first parking lot that you're gonna pass. Um, it is on BLM land and it has a little fire ring established here. And you can't beat these views. I honestly thought someone was gonna shoot my drone down. If I flew too high, it would kind of make the perfect clay target substitute. All right, back on the road. So believe it or not, the road gets even more beautiful up here. Um, I did forget to mention that the area we are riding in is called the Ojito Wilderness. That's O-J-I-T-O. And uh, so you can search it on Google and read a little bit more about it. But one thing to note, especially for motorcyclists is, as with any dirt road, this road can get pretty slick when it has rained recently or snowed recently. Something about this fine dust just turns it into a really, really slippery surface. Uh, it can be a little tricky to keep the bike up. So I don't recommend coming out this way if it has recently rained. Check this out though, wow. I always try to take these corners slow. A lot of people fly through here, but you just never know when there's gonna be someone coming up really fast, especially if they're on the wrong side of the road, which does tend to happen in the off-road situations a lot. 
even if you're out here and you don't have a pre-downloaded route, the road is, is pretty easy, it's marked. There are a few roads that branch off, but in general, the gates are usually closed, so you can tell where you're supposed to be and not. Uh, up here is a sign, I believe, for Ojito Wilderness. Yes, so this sign says Ojito Wilderness on it, so just letting you know that you are in the right spot. Just keep following the main road. And just like that, you're in a totally different terrain out here. That's what I love about this area and this ride. You're in canyons one minute, then you're in open plains the next, and soon we'll be at Cabazon, which I could barely just see peeking above the area ahead of me. I don't know what it is about two wheels. Uh, it just makes me, and a lot of people I guess, but just want to not only explore, but just be in these big, open, wide spaces. And uh, there's something about it. And I would say that's what dual sporting is all about specifically. I don't know, just getting out on two wheels, there's nothing like it. And yeah, it's cold, it's January. Um, I could be at home, but man, I mean, this is something else. And well, I'll just say it sure beats sitting on the couch. All right, guys, check it out. We're gonna get our first view of Cabazon Peak right over this hill. Boom. What a sight. Definitely a lot, like significantly taller than anything else in this area. I always approach rides like this with a lot of caution. It's not that I think anything like this is inherently dangerous. You know, I'm not too far away from Albuquerque. However, anytime that I am going somewhere where there's little to no cell phone service and it's a little bit of a walk to the nearest highway, the nearest person, I always tend to be a lot more cautious. I do a lot of slower riding and I approach corners real slow. And like I was talking about earlier, although this road's pretty darn easy and it's packed, you never know, there's just, there's ruts that appear out of nowhere and there are these deeper patches of sand that could just appear. And that kind of just goes for anywhere in this part of the United States. You just have to be careful of that. So I just don't want to be in a situation personally where I'm out here stranded and no cell phone service and uh, having to push the in reach button or something crazy like that. That's just me. But, uh, you know, as long as you take it slow and then, and of course, with that, I'm here to enjoy the views and cruise. I'm not trying to do this in a record lap time and I don't recommend trying to do this ride that way because then you miss a lot of the scenery and just a lot of uh, neat things to see. So we made it, as you can see, there it is in the background. And uh, it was a great ride. As usual, the XT did super well. It's extremely reliable. I never have to worry about this bike not starting or something not working on it. It's just done really well. So we're gonna head back now, but there's our final views of the Cabazon Peak. And onward back to Albuquerque. And as we head back, I just wanted to let you guys know this road is pretty doable by most cars. In case you are on a four-wheeled vehicle, you just have to go slow. I've seen compact SUVs make it up here. Um, passenger cars, that might be a stretch, uh, especially if they have lower clearances. But in general, I think most other vehicles could make it up here pretty easily. It just depends on the condition of the road though. As I said earlier, if it rained recently or if it snowed recently, then parts of it tend to wash out um, and so they do maintain this, but uh, you just never know. So uh, either way, this stretch right here, this is the stretch that everybody uh, does have to cross over, whether you're going the highway route out to Cabazon Peak or the back way like I did. Um, everyone would hit this stretch of road right here. Uh, so I came from this way, 
um, Highway 550 is that way, which is what I'm going to take now. And just a heads up, there is a parking lot right here that is gravel in case you do decide that you don't want to take that more bumpier road up to the peak over there. And you would encounter this on your right side if you're coming up from Albuquerque on the freeway. All right, guys, thanks for watching and welcome to my garage, by the way. I'll go ahead and put up on the screen a shot of the route I took. Um, from Onyx Off-Road. I actually do think it's a really good app. It's really helpful if you download the area ahead of time so that you can still know where you're at within the context of that particular route. Obviously not sponsored or associated with them because I have like three subscribers, but uh, it's actually a really good app. Also, by the way, if you were just to navigate straight to Cabazon Peak on your own through Google Maps uh, and just take the highway, um, that would look like this. And of course, it's a great ride no matter what method you take to get there. Like I said, brand new channel, so if you found anything in this video helpful or interesting, go ahead and hit that like button. If you didn't like the video, go ahead and hit the like button anyway. And please consider subscribing. Don't forget the bell icon as well so you get notified of future videos. I have some gear reviews that should be posted soon, and I'm also going to be posting reviews of these three bikes behind me as well. Thanks for watching Adventure Moto Southwest, and we'll catch you in the next one.